Hey guys, and welcome to week 10 of International Business. Now, if you can recall from last week, we spoke about the importance of choosing the right strategy for a firm's internationalization. This week, we're looking at that all-important entrance to your selected target market, which is just as important within international business as it is when you're going on Jimmy Fallon tonight, or indeed if you are Willy Wonka. So we're going to go through the different options that you do have as a firm for your entry modes, the advantages and disadvantages with each, and also how they importantly tie in with the selected strategy that we spoke about in last week's lecture. So our objectives for this week in line with that, talk about the key decisions that firms do have to face and make when they are contemplating their internationalization. Looking at the different entry modes themselves uh, that a ch firm can choose from, as well as the advantages and disadvantages that are associated with each of those entry modes. And finally, how all that relates to a firm's core competencies uh, and pressures for cost reductions, which we spoke about last week, in terms of the most appropriate choice of entry mode. Now, there are some key difficult decisions that firms will have to make when they're expanding overseas, even choosing which item on the KFC menu to choose. We've all been there, Morgan Freeman, I feel you. But in today's lecture, we are going to focus on three in particular. Firstly, which of the foreign markets are you going to actually enter? What country are you going to expand into? Secondly, when do you want to enter them? Uh, what is the most appropriate timing of that international expansion? And thirdly, what is the scale on which you're going to enter that market? These are key and difficult questions, but we're going to go through each of them in the following video and then relate how that, uh, or, or explain how that relates to each of the different options that you guys as international business will have when you choose to expand your firm overseas. Alright, so as I say, the first of these key decisions that you'll have to make is which foreign market you actually want to enter. Now, your ultimate choice here should be based on a measured assessment of a country's long-run profit potential. So we're not focusing on short-term gains here. When you're looking to expand overseas, given the level of resources that are necessary to be uh, devoted to that international expansion, you're going to need to be able to recover that over an extended period of time. So what we typically look at here in terms of the attractiveness, uh, attractiveness rather, of a country, uh, uh, it, will, it, will, it will depend upon balancing the things like the benefits, the costs, but also importantly the risks that are associated with doing business in the particular country that you're considering expanding into. Now these will include things like the size of the market. Obviously, you would prefer a larger market given that that will give you a greater number of potential consumers to sell your product to. You'll look at things like the present and future wealth of the consumers in the market. Now ideally, we're looking to expand into a country that has a whole heap of Donald Trumps or not quite, potentially. You know what I mean. <laughs> We're looking for people with significant disposable income because obviously the greater the uh, present and also the future anticipated wealth of the people in that country, the greater the ability of them to spend that money on your products. You're going to look at economic growth rates. You're going to want to make sure that your potential target market uh, has not just uh, present uh, strong economic growth, but also anticipated growth into the future so that you don't have a, an initial honeymoon period when you do expand there only to see that demand for your product drop significantly. You're going to want political stability, and we're not talking about mental stability that would cause, or instability perhaps, that would cause your Prime Minister to eat a raw onion. No, we're talking about the relative stability in terms of the type of government and the type of legislative uh, structure that is in place in a country. So what you don't want, obviously, is to enter a country where there might be a military coup. Uh, in the week after which you enter, or if there's going to be a revolution that is likely to occur. You want at least some stability and sense of assuredness in terms of what you're going to be coming up against and facing, uh, especially, as I say, in terms of that regulatory environment in the future. Finally, you'll also look at the type of economic system. We've spoken a lot about this in the past, over the last few weeks this semester. 
whether, for example, it is a market economy, a command economy, a mixed economy. Each of these different types of economic systems will have different implications in terms of what is going to be most appropriate for what you're trying to sell. But usually firms will target a pure market economy, uh, given that this is where the forces of supply and demand are, are left alone. Uh, and without that government intervention, and tra barriers to trade, uh, which will of course make it easier for the firms to operate in that chosen market. Once you've decided which market you're going to enter, you then need to decide when you're going to do it. And as you can see here, timing is indeed everything. You don't want to be the poor person on the right at the bottom who just can't quite get the timing right. And there are actually a number of advantages uh, that are frequently associated with entering a market early, uh, which are typically known as first move advantages. Now, we have spoken a fair bit about these first move advantages over the duration of the semester, but, the semester rather. But just to recap, these advantages enables firms to preempt rivals by establishing a strong brand name. Obviously, if you're first into the market, then that will give you the best opportunity to establish yourself as the preeminent brand in that particular industry before any other rivals get the chance to do so. It'll also give you the opportunity to build up your sales volume and also ride down that experience curve that we spoke about in previous weeks ahead of your rivals and gain that initial cost advantage over later entrants. It's typically more expensive to establish and build up uh, this reputation and your sales volume after there are already some key competitors in a market uh, than beforehand. It also enables firms to create switching costs to tie those customers into their products or services which make it there then difficult for later entrants to win the businesses. So if you think about this, a lot of firms seek to do it. They'll often uh, offer additional services or related uh, accessories to their products which effectively make it easier to use those products and potentially tie those consumers into uh, the, the future use of those products. Apple do this really well for example. They have uh, for example charges for their phones and products which are specific to Apple products so you can't just use an Apple charger on a Samsung phone or vice versa. Uh, those these brands try and lock you in to using their products and as I say if you're able to be the first firm into the market then you're going to have your charges in that example uh, as the first ones that are sold there which of course makes it easier to uh, get those uh, consumers to buy Apple products again into the future. There are some disadvantages which are associated with entering a foreign market before other international businesses. So it's important to keep a balanced view here. So while we see these first mover advantages, there are also first mover disadvantages. Now there are a number of reasons why these disadvantages may occur. It may be down to the pioneering costs which are necessary to the firm, uh, firm's business, the foreign business system being so foreign and different to that in a firm's home market. So when a firm does look to expand overseas, it usually has to devote considerable time and effort and money more than anything else to learn the rules of the game, so to speak, to acclimatize themselves to the environment and to overcome that liability of foreignness that we spoke about in previous weeks, where we see firms not being familiar with the legal system, with the government members, not having those connections with the political parties, with the supply chains, with the distribution networks and so on. It takes a lot of time, effort and money to sort of understand and establish yourself uh, in that foreign market. There's also the issue of the cost of business failure if the firm, due to uh, its own ignorance, in this new foreign environment makes major mistakes. And this is part of most firms' international expansion. It's difficult to get things absolutely right the first time. It's likely that you'll get at least one aspect of your business expansion wrong, given that you're doing it for the first time and you don't understand fully that international environment. You're used to your home market environment instead. So it's likely that there will be some uh, mistakes that are made and that costs money to rectify those, um, even if you are, and, and some, that's if you're able to do them at all. And finally, there are the costs of promoting and establishing a product offering, especially in relation to the cost of educating consumers, not just how to use a product potentially, but that it even exists in the first place. 
building that brand awareness when you're expanding from a market, your home market where you're very well known to a foreign market where some people may have never even heard of you, that costs money and takes a long time as well. So there are some issues that you do need to be aware of if you're saying, okay, let's quickly jump in to this foreign market ahead of our competitors. Now the final decision you will have to make of these key basic entry decisions is the scale of the entry. Basically, are you going to go all in straight away or are you going to sort of gradually ease yourself into that foreign uh, expansion? So as I say, there are a couple of a few different approaches available to you as a firm here. If you do choose to go down the large scale entry route, then there are a few considerations here. Certainly, Going with this option will require significant strategic commitments, uh, whether but in the form of financial resources, time and effort, and so on. So if you do go all in, so to speak, it's typically a decision that has long-term impact and can be very difficult to reverse. Um, it's not one of those things where you can change your mind if you devote significant large-scale entry commitments to your expansion. It may cause rivals to actually rethink their move and certainly their market entry, as you can see here. So if you basically say, right, we're not sort of just going to half do this, we are really going all in here. That may actually scare off some either potential or even existing rivals in that market if they see that there's a large competitor or at least one that is con uh, committed to devoting all of their time and effort uh, to this foreign expansion, that may force the uh, competitors, either existing or potential, to actually not enter that market given that they may not have the resources to be able to compete against such a large scale entry. It may also lead to an indigenous competitive response. That means that the existing local firms may actually uh, are more likely potentially to sort of uh, retaliate against such a large scale commitment, potentially more than they would a smaller scale entry and the reason why and you, it makes sense if you think about it is that if you've got a competitor coming and say right we are going to take over we're going to be number one we're going to dominate this market as part of this large scale entry then that is much more likely to uh, to force or to stimulate some response from the local competitors than another firm who says okay we're going to sort of start off slow and see how things go that's much less likely to concern and scare um, those local competitors so if you do put all your chips on the table in that sense through this large scale entry you do have to expect that the local firms are going to say right we are going to retaliate and make life difficult for you uh, given that they will be much more likely to be concerned about this new entrant. The other option, as I said, is to go on a much smaller scale entry. So you might decide, right, we'd like to learn about the market. We don't want to go all in before without knowing exactly how the market works, what the particular tastes and requirements and demand is in that particular market. Um, and of course, by doing that, that will reduce your exposure to risk. If it goes wrong, for example, if you get any aspect of your internationalization wrong, um, there's less likelihood you won't have lost as many financial resources uh, in all likelihood and you won't have committed uh, as much time potentially as well so it does give you sort of um a chance to see sort of that how things go and how they may pan out without committing all of your resources now this of course is starting to sound like a pretty attractive option there must be a downside and indeed there is. The issue with a smaller scale entry is that it does limit your ability to take advantage of a lot of those first mover advantages that we spoke about previously. If you're sort of only dipping that toe in the water without committing fully to it, then building up those things necessary for things like economies of scale and the experience curve, um, are, uh, are there are certainly less opportunities there to take advantage of those uh, sorts of things if you are adopting a smaller scale entry. So plenty of key decisions that firms need to uh, be considerate of uh, when they look to expand overseas.